Good morning and welcome to Morning Java from PNC Park. He's Matt Sunday and what? That's the city. <laughs> That's the, the city here Pittsburgh too. back there too. It's fun to have a different backdrop once in a while, right? I like it. How about the foreground being different as well? The Pirates are off to a seven and two start. Uh, their offense is one of the best in baseball. Jamison Tyon, one hit shutout and we'll start with that. Let's start with that and I'll tell you what, the one hit, that was about as close to probably a seeing eye unfortunate hit as you're going to get in the I one hit. I don't even remember. Moment. What was the hit? It went it just oh, just right out of the reach of the shortstop there. Jordy, Jordy and Jay Hay, they both looked at it. It kind of went up the middle of the infield. It wasn't hit hard enough to really get get through there and not feel bad about it. So I'm sure somebody's going to... Nobody's going to oh, regret that. But, yeah, it, I mean, besides the game changes too when it's a no-hitter, the tension sure. changes. So you can never assume a no-hitter under any circumstance. That said, Tyon was just so good, so efficient, and that's because he threw so many fastballs. Uh, yeah, some for strikes. Four seam, two seam. He was pounding the zone. He was efficient. He was seeking out contact, and I know that's become something of a point of controversy because Charlie Morton and Garrett Cole left. They stopped seeking out content. They started striking out the whole world. But this is the benefit of doing that. Yeah, absolutely. As he was pounding the zone, what, he had a couple uh, innings where seven, eight pitches, the, the one inning that he got through. I mean, the guy was just cruising out there. And honestly, it's, it's one of those situations when he comes to the dugout, and I'm looking in the dugout, you expect him to just show any type of emotion. Oh, no, once, no, no. once he... Once he walks off the mound with that, he bites his lips a little bit, and then he's in the dugout. Nobody talks to him. He's just kind of on his but own. But you like to see that, too. That's the poise that you want to see from a really talented starting pitcher. Tyon's off to a, a tremendous start. And speaking of poise and confidence and all that other stuff, how about Gregory Polanco right now? Oh, coffee. Oh, my goodness. He hit a ball way out there somewhere. Like, was that seven or eight rows yeah, up? I think somewhere out there. Did it, it came down at one point? He is uh, he is right now just feeling it. And the thing is, when you talk to him, the first thing out of his mouth is always something about his strength, about his health. You can tell that that is 100% of his focus right now. Yeah, when we were down in Bradenton, Lance and I talked quite a bit about how he looked more athletic. He looked leaner. He looks like he was ready to go out and try to put together a full season of baseball, something that he has not really been able to do uh, for the Pirates here. But with that, he's been crushing the ball. It's not like he lost any of his power. He looks stronger. He yeah, looks see, more powerful. That's the thing about Polanco is that he's strange in that he's got that long Dave Parker-like swing here, for those of you who would go back that far, uh, where he comes all the way around. And that can create problems at times if you're not in optimal condition. Now, when I say that, you got to be careful here. He was in great shape last year. It just wasn't necessarily baseball shape. He bulked up like a tight end. Yeah, he was top heavy, right? That's yeah. one thing that like like this. Yeah, I mean, we talked about that a lot last year. Just so heavy up top, kind of the thinner legs, and his his legs still look almost a little bit disproportionate to to his yeah, body out he's there. Got, he's got those really thin legs, but when his speed, his bat his bat speed is entered back into the equation. Now you see him come around, and when he does make contact, obviously that long swing benefits him. It's just been wonderful to watch. Look, take nothing away from the start that they've had, the homestand that they had, but let's focus on a couple of concerns here. Uh, one is that the competition hasn't been great. We're being kind here. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, they've played the Reds, they've played Detroit, and Minnesota can hit Minnesota the ball. Minnesota, but... yeah, they've got a lineup, right. But they but they put Lance Lynn out there, which is, in this ballpark, is like forfeiting. Yeah, and, you know, Odoritz, he never really got his stuff going. So, I mean, it's just the the, the two guys that they faced there, they're, they were able to hit, and then the Reds, I mean, they just they slaughtered these guys with the Well, they, the should, they actually should have taken all four of them, but never mind that because the Cubs are going to be coming up next. Another concern is the obvious, and that's the bullpen. Now, the bullpen didn't come into play on Sunday because of, you know, Tyon pitching the whole way. But, man, at some point, you know? I'm going to throw you something. All right. Tyler Glass now. Oh, no. Tyler Glass now. Storms off the set. <laughs> no, listen, listen, listen. Have fun with the rest of the show Sunday. <laughs> if Dovidas Navaraskis is going to be your guy in that sixth inning, he's going to have to get it together because it's, it's not been together. Yeah, the thing with Navaraskis is that he has a pitch that's his bread and butter, a 
okay? And that's that cutter. And it isn't working for him. So all he's doing is going to B pitches and C pitches constantly. And that's just not going to work for anybody. He needs to figure that out. I'm telling you, though. But but do go on about listen, Glass now listen, saving the bullpen. I know that they're talking about no leverage situations right now, big leads or big deficits. But the guy the other day was looking to first base. He was throwing to first base. He was keeping runners where they were. He was pounding the zone. And with his stuff, if he puts it over the plate, like we're talking about with Tyon, that's the kind of stuff that's going to get out. I'm not saying he's going to save the bullpen, but this guy looks different to me. And I want to see him get, I want to see the next chance that he gets. We have found, ladies and gentlemen, the one person in Pittsburgh who I'm truly enjoying it. Enjoyed the class I enjoyed it the now. other day. It was good stuff. <laughs> Whoa, 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 whoa. What's in your cup, DK? What is up in the cup here? This is the segment of the Java where, you know, you contribute something here. We have something from the Boomer. It's pretty interesting. He says, uh, he or she says, a question needs to be posed to another cardboard cutout commissioner from a similar region, New York State. That's a reference to not Rob Manford, but more Gary Bettman, I assume here. When will umpires have any accountability or minimum competency standards with regard to to job performance. Um, here's what I'll say, and I'm going to presume a lot here with your question, Boomer, uh, in that you're probably talking balls and strikes since there weren't really any controversial. I would guess so. We don't, we don't see the strike zone with... But here's the thing. Those boxes that you see on your TV screen are BS. They are not what will be judged or what will be used to judge balls and strikes if it ever if it ever comes to robot umps it, the box needs to be adjusted to the height yeah. of the batter to the stance of the batter there's just a lot more that goes into it look how how could judge how could Aaron judge and who's the second baseman up there in New York the the guy that's about half my size let alone a third of, of judges how, how can those two guys have the same strike zone yeah I mean it, it's it's you know and there won't be that's the thing is with the, the the baseball strike zone that's been set in the rules since the late 1800s is from somewhere on your uniform to a part of your body. Now, that part's been adjusted, whether it's the yeah. letters to the knees or above the knees or at the knees or whatever it is. But look, someday that's going to happen. But don't presume that what you see on TV, just because that thing flashes up there, that it should have been a strike that it was. I'm actually not a fan of the mechanical athletics. I, I really... I like to see that element of, of the human error involved in the game still. And I know when you see the play at the plate, and of course you can go down to Atlanta and talk about, you know, whether a guy's safe or out. Or but That's different than balls and strikes. They're automated. I mean, that sure. would be automated. That would be like tennis. Sure, yeah. You know, it, the, the tennis is the one that, that really stands out for me because they, they went and said, look, either a ball hits the chalk or it isn't, and they use lasers for it. But, but even, even the difference between Gregory Polanco's strike zone and, and Josh Harrison's, even beyond that, I, I want that. I want those Rembrandts out there throwing, just painting the corners from from the mound. I want there to be some semblance of Russell Martin, you know, framing a pitch. There's framing, but there's also part of the game. When people talk about what's part of the game, it's not just the human element, but part of the game is that the, again, since the Civil War, since they started playing this game, pitchers had to learn how to adjust to umpires. Sure. That's part of the process. Hitters have to adjust. That's why players, uh, pitchers who can go deep into games are more valuable. Hitters who can get a hit in the third at bat, learning the strike zone. Yeah, and the integrity of the game doesn't have to mean that something that's a strike is always a strike in that spot, right? Yeah. Like, it doesn't have to... It doesn't have to be absolute. Exactly. Thanks for the question.